Hi, I'm James McElvenny, and you're listening to the History and Philosophy of the Language Sciences podcast, online at hifilangsci.net. There you can find links and references to all the literature we discuss. Today, we're talking to Randy Harris, who is professor of both English language and literature and computer science at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Among other things, Randy is the author of The Linguistics Wars, the classic account of the generative semantics controversy that engulfed generative linguistics in the 1960s and 70s. A second edition of Randy's book came out in 2021, and I've been wanting to talk to him about it since then. But as a history podcast, we are by definition behind the times. So it's only appropriate that we're only getting to his book now. So, so Randy, can you tell us what were the linguistics wars? Who were the chief combatants and what were they fighting about? Uh, well, first, just thanks for inviting me on. I'm a, a big fan of the uh, podcast. It's a really um, important and interesting uh, podcast about the history of linguistics. And I'm also uh, a fan of your work, your, your Ogden book, um, A Language and Meaning. It is really, really uh, valuable. And I'm looking forward to the, to the new one that you've got uh, coming out on the history of modern linguistics. So maybe the best way to start is just to talk about how I entered the project in the first place. So I was a, a PhD student, um, and I just discovered a field uh, called rhetoric. My other degrees were in uh, literature and, and, and linguistics before I got there. And I was casting around. I'd originally gone to do communication theory, but it turned out that the department wasn't really as strong in that as I thought. And they had a really good uh, rhetorician, and he was doing something uh, called Rhetoric of Science, which is basically the study of uh, scientific argumentation. I started reading in that field uh, quite a bit and and uh, and studying under him, uh, Michael Halloran. And then when it came time to write a dissertation, I started casting around for uh, scientific episodes. One of the themes of Rhetoric of Science at, the, at that point was mostly looking at controversies, looking how scientific disputes get resolved or fail to get resolved through uh, through war in camps. I read Fritz Neumeier's book, Linguistic Theory in America, and that uh, one, of the, one of the key chapters is about uh, this group called the Generative Semanticists and Chomsky uh, coming uh, at odds with each other. But I'd also read a review of the book by James McCauley, who's one of the people associated with the uh, linguistics uh, wars on the Generative Semanticist side. And it was fairly polite, but said that basically Neumeier's book didn't tell the whole story. So I thought, well, I'd, I'd look into this a bit, and I and I wrote basically all of the major players. Uh, so I wrote uh, Chomsky, of course, and the the major players on the generative semanticist side were uh, Paul Postel, who was a, a colleague of Chomsky's uh, just before that, George Lakoff, uh, John Robert Ross, Hadge Ross, and Ray Jackendoff, who was who was aligned with Chomsky in this in this dispute. But also a lot of people sort of around the the dispute: uh, Gerald Katz, Jerry Fodor. Thomas Bever, Arnold Zwicky, Jay Kaiser, Robert Lees, Morris Halla, Jerry Sadock, Howard Lasnick, just everybody who ha had seemed to have something to say about that dispute and about the theories around them. And I got just an overwhelming uh, response. Everybody wanted to talk about it. I can't remember the exact order in which it happened, whether it was a response to a letter that invited me to call or a phone call as a response to my initial letter to Lakoff. But Lakoff and I were on the phone for like an hour and a half uh, one night, him just going through what everything was all about. So this was 20 years after the dispute, more or less, and everybody was still wanting to uh, talk about it. There was still uh, hurt, hurt feelings and incensed attitudes and so forth. And I was coming at it from a completely different discipline uh, and a, a PhD student, not, not uh, anybody really in the field. And all of them wanted to talk to me. So it grew into a kind of oral history project. I, I traveled around and, and interviewed them all. I ended up with like 500 some odd pages of transcripts of, of interviews. I met uh, Lakoff in a, in a bar in Cambridge. I talked to Chomsky for hours in his office. I went to the University of Chicago. Um, and one of the sociological center points of the uh, Gender of Semantic Society was the University of Chicago, especially all of the conferences and publications out of the Chicago Linguistic Society, and talked to uh, Macaulay and Sadoc and so forth there. So everybody wanted to talk about it. It was a really interesting uh, story. What was it? I'll give you the scientific development story first. So 
Noam Chomsky and his collaborators, most uh, prominently Paul Postel and Gerald Katz, developed a theory, coalesced in a in the book Aspects of the Theory of uh, Syntax in 1965, that had this central notion of deep structure. The model itself was was structured as a process model where you generate sentences, um, and it was a sentence grammar, not an utterance uh, grammar. All of the all of the proponents denied that it was a process. They just talked about it as an abstract model of linguistic knowledge in some way. But it was shaped as a as a process model in which you had a set of syntactic rules, phrase structure rules, that generated a syntactic structure uh, and a bag of of words, a dictionary, a lexicon uh, that then populated the the structure. And then what you got was the deep structure, which wasn't what we speak with or write with, but an underlying representation that somehow uh, crystallized essential aspects of, of how we speak, one of them being a uh, semantic. So a paradigm case would be the, the passive transformation. The phrase structure rules in lexicon give you something like John walked the dog, and that might percolate through with a, a, a few adjustments in terms of, of morphology and then percolate through to the surface structure which was a much closer representation to how we talked. Or it might go through a passive transformation and come out as the dog was walked by John. The arguments around that uh, focused on the fact that both John walked the dog and the dog was walked by John have essentially the same semantics, the same role, the same walker and walkie, agent and and, and, and patient. And so the claim uh, developed that transformations don't change meaning, that meaning uh, resides in the in the deep structure. That's the 1965 aspects case. So, several linguists, most notably Lakoff, Ross, and Postel, uh, started enriching the semantics of of deep structure, making it more and more uh, semantically responsible, until it effectively came, became for the generative semanticist the semantic representation. The aspects model had a, a set of semantic interpretation rules that looked at the deep structure and found out what the meaning was. But the generative semanticist said that the semantic representation was deep structure effectively. So what exactly is a semantic representation in this model? Is it propositional semantics only, or does it include even details of what we would now consider pragmatics? Well, uh, still in the immediate aftermath of aspects, just just propositional uh, semantics entirely. But the argument started to coalesce around dismantling deep structure. So one set of arguments around the verb uh, kill, for instance, kill could be seen as cause to die. Cause to die could be seen as, or die could be seen as not, not, not alive. And so kill could be seen as cause to be not alive. And then uh, in the generative semantic approach, these were assembled into the surface structure. You uh, assemble the bits and pieces. So things like cause, not, alive, were all semantic primitive, semantic uh, predicates in and of themselves that got assembled into the words that we spoke with. And if, if that's the case, you can't have a, a level of deep structure that inherits words they're, it's it's building words. And can um, I just quickly ask, what was the nature sure. of these semantic primitives? Are they like what Vish Biska was talking about in the 70s? Yes, very close. Yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, Vish Biska uh, was associated with the early generative semantics as well. I think she visited MIT when, when uh, this stuff was starting to develop and sort of mutual influence at that point. Um, but there were also some quite arcane arguments around uh, around the, the level of deep structure that that led to lots of vituperation. Okay, still sticking with the scientific uh, story, Chomsky apparently thought this was wrong, that the deep structure shouldn't be deeper, um, but in fact should be shallower. And he built some arguments around things like nominalizations. So the aspects theory would relate a sentence like, uh, Russia destroyed... Uh, Mariupol with the noun phrase, Russia's destruction of Mariupol. So Chomsky wanted to put this process into the lexicon. So transformations have been used to build nominalizations out of out of verbs, for instance. So his approach was to weaken transformations, whereas the generative semanticists uh, wanted to strengthen them, undercut their lexical powers, like the assembly uh, into uh, kill from cause to be not alive, retrench 
the semantic interpretation rules enrich the semantics of the surface structure. So wholly opposed to the generous fanaticist move to go to take semantics deeper and deeper. So at, at this point in, say, 1967, 68, you've got two fairly distinct theories, generative semantics, Lakoff, Ross, Macaulay, Postal, also uh, Robin Lakoff, and interpretive semantics, Chomsky, mostly Chomsky, also uh, Ray Jackendoff, building a lot of arguments around semantic interpretation rules and, and ex parse syntax, which was introduced at this point also to, in part, to undermine transformations like, like the normalization transformation, and Ray Doherty and others. So that's the scientific story. Uh, generative semantics seem to be taking charge, um, leading the field, but then Chomsky's retrenchments um, and developments ascended, and the kind of conventional uh, version, especially at the time, was that uh, Chomsky and the interpretive semantics has simply won the argument, and uh, linguistics should uh, favor this kind of interpretive uh, grammar that that Chomsky was uh, was advocating. The label he was giving at the time was extended standard theory, which was in a way sort of accurate, but also a, a kind of a nifty rhetorical move because he rebranded the aspects theory as the standard theory and generative semantics as one deviation of it, the wrong-headed deviation of it, and the extended standard theory as a way of taking it in the right direction. So again, that's just the basic scientific story. The, the sociological and rhetorical story that Ross um, and especially Lakoff were uh, deliberately outpacing Chomsky and trying to dominate the, the theory by, by taking it in, in a given direction. And again, that, that direction was perceived to be fairly popular, fairly responsible at the time. Chomsky apparently was allergic to Lakoff, just really disliked him intensely. Uh, again, this is based on uh, on this kind of quasi oral history project. Everybody talking about uh, about the way things uh, flared up. Chomsky attacked Lakoff in his class. Lakoff attacked uh, Chomsky in his classes at, at Harvard. But but the real center point of the uh, of the dispute early on was in Chomsky's classes at at MIT. Lakoff attended them. Uh, not a student. Uh, Ross attended them, uh, not really a, a student any longer either. He was Chomsky's student, but at that point he wasn't uh, signing up for courses. Robin Lakoff attended them, who was a student at, at Harvard at the time. Jack and Evan Doherty were there. They were uh, direct students. It's not unusual, by the way, for Chomsky's classes to be attended by uh, lots of people who aren't, um, aren't his students. His syntax classes were quite famous, and people would uh, travel in from all over the place to take his syntax classes. Uh, Howard Lasnick was telling me I had kept an apartment in Cambridge. He was uh, te teaching in Connecticut and kept kept an apartment just so he could go back and and uh, attend the lectures. MIT would would schedule the Chomsky classes on the basis of the enrollment, so just a standard kind of classroom. And it turned into like the black hole of Calcutta with everybody lining the walls and, and sort of standing room only. And so they after that MIT started scheduling those courses in lecture halls and stuff. And, so in any case, it's not unusual for, for people not directly studying under Chomsky to, to be there. But the classes were reputed to be really cantankerous. From Lakoff's uh, perspective, Chomsky would misrepresent the generative semanticists' proposals and distort them. And then he would politely stand up and oppose them. But Chomsky would shout him down. Uh, Jack and Doc would weigh in. And they were just kind of uh, remembered as very cantankerous, mostly with Lakoff on one side and, and, and Chomsky on the on the other, but everybody else weighing in in various ways. And it fanned out from there. So it really took over the discipline for seven, eight, 10 years or so, affecting uh, peer reviews and publication and uh, hiring and at conferences. There was a famous plenary session at the LSA where Jack and Doth and Lakoff were, were hurling obscenities at each other. And so very, very cantankerous and took over the entire discipline of linguistics, more or less, in North America in particular, for, for about 10 years. But does that mean that all of linguistics in North America was bound up with the generative school by this stage? No, not all, but but the but the bulk of it, for sure. And that, in, in part, it's because, because of how popular Chomsky's work was from syntactic structures onto um, aspects. So linguistics expanded really dramatically in the in the sixties and seventies. Lots of lots of uh, money pouring into it. Lots of uh, departments starting up and expanding and so forth on the basis of, of popularity of Chomsky's theories. And so 
overwhelmingly, it was the generative uh, program that was that was being developed in most places. There were certainly lots of uh, existing linguistic programs before that, but even those ones were generally dominated by generative approaches. And the linguistics was interesting to anyone who isn't a linguist. I mean, apart from being an example of the rhetoric of science, is there any interest that we can draw from them? I mean, the central actors, Chomsky and Lakoff, and especially Chomsky, are of course quite famous for the roles that they've played outside disciplinary linguistics. So for their participation in and commentary on political discourse. But do these arguments over deep structure have any broader repercussions? Are they anything more than inconsequential theoretical debates within one branch of American linguistics? Now, in, in some sense, no, certainly not the debates around deep structure that uh, started everything off. So a typical uh, argument around deep structure, for instance. So again, uh, transformations were were held not to change uh, meaning. Um, and that was a position that was developed um, most uh, directly by Paul Postel and uh, Gerald Katz. And so it was called the Katz Postal Principle. So there are lots of arguments around the Katz Postal Principle about, about deep structure. One of the most famous is around um, sentences like, um, everyone in Canada speaks two languages, and two languages are spoken by everyone in Canada. That looks like a uh, transformation has changed meaning because it, it's either that at least two languages are spoken by everybody uh, versus there are two languages that are spoken by everybody. There was an attempt to kind of save the phenomena by saying, well, that both interpretations are latent, both meanings are latent, and it's only context that highlights one. So that was the kind of generative semantics approach to kind of save the cat's postal principle. We're on the, the interpretive semantics side. It was proof that transformations did change meaning. So the cat's postal principle had to be rejected. And if you reject the cat's postal principle, then you can't have a deep layer of semantics because the transformations are going to rearrange things and that destroys generative semantics. What happened out of that argument was basically uh, people stopped talking about it and the passive transformation was abandoned. So the arguments around deep structure, not so much, but they they kind of sponsored a divergence that took uh, much, much larger dimensions. So. In terms of the uh, substance of the of the debate, one of the most immediate consequences is that transformations lost their appeal and eventually just went away. They were the major mechanism of linguistics for uh, about 15 years. And then they, because of this debate, uh, people started developing all kinds of alternative grammars like lexical functional grammar and uh, generalized phrase structure grammar, head-driven uh, phrase structure grammar and so forth. Um, other things like relational grammar and and word grammar all kind of develop as alternatives to a transformationally driven grammar. And eventually even Chomsky abandoned transformation. So it reshaped linguistics uh, really substantially, even though it seemed to start on a quite minor technical matter. But it also enveloped a lot of quite a bit more substantial uh, issues as the debate went on. So the nature of uh, of cognition with respect to language. The generative position uh, was that there's a, a universal grammar, a language acquisition device, some kind of genetically wired module that just needs a little bit of exposure to language to grow a language. That so was literally one of the terms that Chomsky used about how language developed was it just grew in the same way that an Adam's apple will grow. Or his argument was that humans grow arms and uh, doves grow wings because of genetic predispositions in the same way humans grow a language. Uh, so all more or less hardwired. Whereas the arguments against Chomsky began to align against that position, this uh, innate mechanism, and notions of general purpose cognition, categorization, the influence of analogy and correlation, pattern biases, uh, embodiment, force dynamics, the role of attention and memory, context, all of those, all of those things began to uh, develop in opposition to Chomsky and developed into a uh, full-fledged and interesting theories of linguistics, the nature of meaning and representation. So on the, on the transformational grammar side, the, the Chomsky side, meaning was effectively propositional, compositional, dictionary kind of meaning where you, you inserted words into propositions and had rules that, that told you what those propositions meant versus an encyclopedic kind of sense of meaning that any given use of a of a word calls upon a, a frame of knowledge around the use of that word. So non-compositionality 
in terms of the representation of, of meaning, even the representation of of uh, syntactic meaning, which had traditionally been basically a, a kind of uh, item and arrangement program where you had rules that aligned uh, words which sponsored propositions and so forth. The whole notion of the, the relevance of rules versus kind of a symbolic attraction amongst terms. So a lot of very substantial territory was covered that sort of developed out of that initial debate around deep structure. Um, so if we turn specifically to your book, what changes have you made between the, the first edition and this new edition? And why did you think that a, that a new edition was necessary? Well, um, Oxford asked for a new edition. The first one was uh, quite popular. And, and I think, frankly, although it was never articulated, I think, frankly, there was also a sense that Chomsky is a major figure uh, who's not going to be around forever. And when he passes, there's going to be a lot of attention paid to his work. And Oxford, I think, might want wanted to be prepared by having this book about him that that had that had sold and got reviewed quite quite well in a in a new edition. But for 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 my purposes, um, it just struck me as a, as an unfinished story. I, I guess all history is unfinished. But so the first book ends on two sort of notes. One, the right of salvage, a really good term that Postal coined in an interesting article called the Rhetoric of Linguistics. Rhetoric being used there as a pejorative, not a way that a rhetorician would use it as a study of argumentation and, and persuasion, but it's still a really fun and insightful article. So it ends on these two notes, the right of salvage and the greening of linguistics. The right of salvage was about mostly about Chomsky's program, adopting many, many positions that, are, that were either proposed or arose directly out of, out of the work by Jenner Semanticis. So um, logical form, for instance, was a semantic representation that was developed by Macaulay and, and Lakoff uh, mostly, and it starts to play a much bigger role in Chomsky linguistics after this. Even such things as a, a logical form rule of quantifier raising is basically an inversion of a rule of Lakoff's called quantifier lowering. Um, so it's, bas it's, it's uh, basically a, a mirror image. Also, the entire framework of Chomsky's approach, this is when the minimalist program with its basic property gets proposed, which is which is effectively that grammar connects uh, meaning and an output of some kind, which is basically the model of generative semantics, the model that posted one of his papers called uh, homogeneous one. So you've, it's basically a homogeneous series of transformations that take you from meaning to articulation. Also, he abandoned deep structure eventually. He abandoned transformations he adopted many of the claims, and when I say he, I mean his program. So there was a type of rule that uh, that the generative semantics proposed called global rules. What global rules did, again, was a, a way of kind of saving the cat's postal principle by being able to sort of give the semantic representation a kind of peek into the transformational cycle in certain sorts of ways. And it uh, kind of maintained the power of transformations that the Chomskyans were attempting to reduce and they were attacked really, really vociferously. This is one of the clearest roles of obvious rhetoric in the um, in the debate, and that virtually all the sins of gender semantics were hung around this notion of globality, which was claimed to make the grammar and transformation in particular much, much more powerful when they needed to be restricted. But Chomsky and the Chomskyans adopted many of these global proposals without calling them global proposals. They attacked globality as a rhetorical phenomenon, but still salvaged many of the developments in that line of uh, argumentation. So the basic structure of the minimalist program, logical form, aspects of globality, the abandonment of deep structure, the abandonment of transformations, all virtually without uh, acknowledgement uh, or just very minimal acknowledgement, things that came out of generative semantics. I mean, the generative semantics began by arguing for the abolishment of deep structure. Chomsky abandons deep structure and doesn't even reference uh, these arguments, just kind of sets it aside. So that's the right of salvage, the, the fact that m much of the technical machinery of generative semantics lived on, but lived on in Chomsky's program. The greening of linguistics is the inverse direction, the opening up of linguistics, as opposed to the kind of retrenching of the uh, Chomskyan positions. So a kind of cracking of the Chomskyan hegemony, 
I overstated that, I think, considerably in the in the first book. But the, so the meaning of linguistics is is the move away from the Chomskyan hegemony. So the development of pragmatics, which you mentioned, that became really instrumental in in uh, in generative semantics. Many of uh, uh, the earliest pragmatic linguists came directly out of generative semanticists. The welcoming of functional and social linguistic argumentation, which had been pretty much banned from the generative program as as uh, inconsequential, not 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 fundamental to linguistics, especially not fundamental to competence, uh, linguistic knowledge, which which uh, the Chomskyans uh, focused on. Evidence from psycholinguistics became considerably more important. The generativist program tended to cherry pick psycholinguistic argumentation. So if it supported their positions, they would cite it. And if it didn't support their positions, they would ignore it or denounce it. And their positions might change and something that they endorsed they would then reject a little bit later on. Whereas in this generative semantics outflow, the linguists that were moving in that direction would allow psycholinguistic arguments to drive their linguistic theories as opposed to only support it if they could manage to cherry pick it in the right way. Evidence from, from corpus studies, it was positively discouraged and scorned uh, in the Chomsky program, but now evidence from corpus linguistics became important. So all of that is the end of the story in, in the first edition of Linguistic Wars. And what I wanted to do, but it sort of just sort of caps it off as this is a direct, the greening of linguistics is a sort of direction um, that's opening up without any kind of consolidation, really. But what I wanted to do is tell the story of how it did uh, consolidate into things like construction grammar and frame semantics and cognitive linguistics generally, and also follow up the generativist story through a minimalism, the Fox P2 story that looked like it supported universal grammar for a while, looked like there was a grammar gene, uh, and that got a lot of a lot of press. The Daniel Everett uh, Piraha story that looked like it undermined recursion, which is pretty much all that was left of uh, of Chomsky and uh, notion of universal grammar by the early 2000s. And, and then again, to, to follow out the, the development of frame semantics, construction grammar, cognitive linguistics more generally. I also discounted Lakoff's role, I think, Lakoff's subsequent role, and I wanted to uh, kind of restore that in a sense. I, I presented Lakoff mostly as a kind of a gadfly um, with a lot of intellectual insights, but no coherent program at all. And that comes pretty directly out of out of uh, Neumeier's uh, Linguistic Theory of America. And that's, I think, pretty much how he looked at the in, in the early 90s when I wrote uh, Linguistic Wars. But Lakoff, in correspondence and discussed with me, insisted that he was a much more influential linguist than I, than I took him to be at the time. And certainly history has proved him right. The cognitive linguistics program uh, around things like image schema, uh, so-called conceptual metaphor theory, things of that sort. Lakoff has been incredibly influential in. So I wanted to to acknowledge his role in the subsequent development of the field. Also, Robin Lakoff, by the way, my treatment of her in the first edition is continuing the standard misogynist approach of downplaying the role of, of female scholars. And in a sense, I kind of inherited it, but I should have I should have known better. And again, that's something that that George Lakoff insisted on in our correspondence, especially after the dissertation that the book was developed on, that I just didn't give her enough credit. But I, I continued not to give her enough credit in the first book. I wanted to uh, revisit that and, and give her more credit, especially on the influence of the field um, afterwards. So I follow up the story uh, further and I uh, attend to some of the players uh, in more detail than I did initially. What changes do you think there'd be if there was a third edition in another 30 years? Well, I'd have to look back in 30 years, right? I, I don't think I would have predicted. In fact, I didn't predict the kind of consolidation of cognitive linguistics in the first edition that transpired. There were hints of it, but I thought it was I thought it was mostly Langacker going to, going to sort of have an alternate theory that was going to grow and sort of uh, maintain a simple period. And Langacker has certainly been important, but I wouldn't have I, I didn't predict the, the kind of uh, developments that uh, that fall out. Or maybe I could put the question like this, you know, a lot of the central actors are still alive and more or less active, although as you as you mentioned, um, people are starting to disappear. Do you think that it's still all too recent for us to really look back on this episode insightfully? Or do you think that, you know, when dusk descends and the owl of Minerva spreads its wings and takes flight, that 
we'll have a better view of what actually took place, what the actual significance of this episode is. I guess at some point history ends, uh, you know, uh, and we can maybe look back. Uh, but but no, I, I don't I don't think this moment doesn't bring us a lot of insight in, into the into what came out of that dispute. I, again, I, I think a lot of important developments in uh, linguistics of the 21st century, the shape it has, uh, comes out of comes out of that debate. So I, I think we can see what the effects have been and whether or not they continue or branch off in another direction. Uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to speculate. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much for answering those questions. Um, thanks again for having me. It was uh, it was fun. Again, I, I I love the podcast. Thanks. <laughs>